week's podcast was um, how to bring your best to a team. And I don't know if any of you have listened this week yet to Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat. So Bruce's podcast. Um, And one of the things that he was saying there, the person that he interviewed, a guy called Owen, was that we feel less connected to our teams than ever before. So probably because most of us are not in the same place every day. We're working in a very different way. Um, But I thought I would test that assumption of kind of how connected we all feel. So let me know using stars on the screen um, if you can, if you can do the annotation. Um, I'm sure we'll put those instructions in the chat for you as well. How connected do you feel, (coughs) excuse me, to your team? How connected do you feel? So... <clears throat> 10 or 8 or 9 is like yeah I feel I feel really connected um other people might be like actually no I feel quite quite remote um no right or wrong just just interested to see interesting to see where you're starting from I think with this it could be that Owen Sam it could be um I'll have to have a look yeah you wrote about teamwork and culture that sounds that sounds right uh let's have a look so we've got quite a range. I'm just going to move these so that we can get everybody in. Quite a range of people. And actually good to see lots of us are sort of here. I think anything here, you're feeling like you're, you're kind of doing okay. Um, I think anything below six, probably not as connected as we would want to be to our teams. Um, out of interest, what gets in the way? So let me know in chat again, rather than assuming what might get in the way, what gets in the way of feeling connected to your team? Because it is hard to bring your best to a team if you don't feel connected to them, because when we feel connected, we care. Oh, that's interesting. So we feel connected to some of the people. Um, maybe sometimes new people don't see the value in staying connected, things being virtual. That would be the assumption that because we work virtually and remotely, we aren't as connected. But I do wonder whether that's uh, as sort of as work has changed. We have to sort of go, well, we need to find a new way then. We can't kind of give up on connection. Um, Otherwise, you do get into that. Well, everyone then needs to come back to the office, um, which doesn't feel like the right answer either. I don't think Um, people don't want to come to the office. Uh, Yeah. So there is something about kind of where everyone's working. People have got more individual roles, time zones. Uh, yeah, Laura, interesting, not having those kind of softer conversations. So, um, yeah, where you're standing outside a meeting room and you're like, oh, you know, what's what's happening? You just like make small talk. But it's often how you get to know people. Uh, different work styles. Everyone's kind of got their heads down. Uh, yeah. Finding a communication method that works for everybody. Yeah. Sometimes how you're feeling in a moment, definitely, Katrina, yeah. So sometimes if you're very like task orientated, maybe you don't feel like you're contributing as much to team culture. Um, yeah, okay. Just worth recognizing. I think if you are thinking about bringing your best to a team, worth thinking about where are you starting from in terms of how connected you feel to that team, because it will definitely influence your ability to bring your best to a team. And it also might influence the actions that you choose. So, for example, somebody said in the chat, you might think, well, it's not about being connected to everyone, but maybe I want to try and be connected to a few more people. Um, Or maybe I could think of some ways, given we all work remotely, to sort of stay connected. So once we are connected or at least feel more connected, then it gives everybody the chance to kind of bring their best. Uh, And I want you to think now about the team that you have been in where you felt the most connection and where you felt the most sort of collaboration, you you felt like it was a high performing team, what was happening in that team? So if you were thinking back to that team or maybe you're in that team now, what do you notice? What would you observe about that team where people are very connected? Oh, waitressing, that's so interesting. Maybe that's, you know, you're all in it together. Um, It feels safe, Laura, yeah. Let's get some of these down. We'll feel safe. Fun. Interesting. Um, I'm actually just writing a section on learning through play at the moment. Um, and it is not a difficult section to write because there are there is so much evidence around fun and playfulness, how connected it makes you feel, how much more productive people are. 
there's um, a great example. There's a Guardian article by a lady called Dr. Heidi Edmondson. Um, and she put sort of 10 minutes of play every day into a A&E department of all, of all places. Um, and it reduced nurse turnover by 30% and overall staff turnover by half across a year by putting 10 minutes of play in a day. So I was like, oh, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, lots of you saying, Fern, it was impactful. Equal work chat and human chat, yeah. Shared purpose, that's interesting. Let's come back to that. Felt value, valuable and voiced your decisions, yeah. Voice your opinions, felt empowered. That's really nice as well. Different types of social, yeah, not just sort of pub after work drinks. When I was writing about um, this kind of idea of play and looking at examples, so one of the companies who were talking about it were IDEO. IDEO are a big design company who you'd imagine would be good at play. And one of the things that they said is you've got to be really careful about things like forced fun. So you've got to do things that are fun, but you've got to give people the option to sort of how they opt in, how they get involved, um, because otherwise people just dread it. Because there's sort of equal with like fun. There's often like equal dread and equal anticipation, depending on sort of how that's how it's actually done, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and like I would be, I would be in that camp. Like I don't. Funnily enough, I am organised, but I don't like to be. I'm. I'm not sort of. I don't like organised fun in that kind of way. Um, and certainly, like going to a pub and stuff wouldn't wouldn't work for me. That's sort of not what I would want to do. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay. I also thought it was useful to look at bringing your best to a team uh, from a kind of opposite perspective. So what does a team need to bring to you for you to be your best? So in the podcast, we were like, what do you need to do to kind of take ownership? But actually, if we zoomed out and if we thought about well, what, what are the conditions that a team needs to have for you to be able to, to be your best, which is some of what we've just described, what might that look like? So I was reading one of the research articles that we uh, linked to in the pod note, and they suggested uh, three things. And I think some of these things have come up from what we've said so far. The first is a team needs to have a sense of direction. So a clear sense of why we are here, what we are here to do, um, very clear goals. Interestingly, those goals need to not be too easy. So they do need to feel kind of challenging and ambitious. Um, but everyone needs to have that kind of sense of, I know why we are here, not just I know why I am here. Um, and feel connected to that direction, which is easy to say, but actually I've been in loads of teams where that is quite hard to do. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, people go in different directions. Um, maybe a team has got a direction that feels a bit disconnected from the company direction. So just like this is a useful question, I think, to ask yourself, how clear are you on kind of what your team is here to do? What does success look like? Um, and just because it might not be sort of your job to lead a team, it doesn't mean that we can't influence a team or that we can't ask them really good questions. So direction is the first one. Second one is actually about structure. So this is... Um, having the right uh, balance of skills in a team. So, you know, when we've talked previously with people like Matthew Syed about things like cognitive diversity, if you've got a team, for example, um, that's got loads and loads of people in it, so a really, really big team, and that team is expected to all be equally connected, that's very hard to do. So that's where when you've got massive teams, like I've been in teams where the whole function would have been 150 people, 200 people, but there's always teams within teams. It's that, um, I think it was Jeff Bezos at Amazon who said, um, you know, the whole, we should all be able to share a pizza thing. Um, and I'm sure it's McKinsey who did that research on optimal size for a team is probably about eight people, like eight to 10 people, two pizza teams, yeah. So it's A, making sure that you've sort of got the right people in the team, um, to use that kind of Jim Collins phrase uh, for other people who like Jim Collins. Have you got the right people on the bus and are they sitting in the right places? So are they doing the right jobs for them? And just making sure that you've got a mix of experiences as well. So structurally, like, have we got the right people in the team? I guess if this is more, this feels more like the why we are here, 
the structure one actually when I was reading it feels more like the who like who have we got in that team have we got the right people I think you can have a really clear sense of direction and not have the right people in the team um and I've been in those teams and you see that it's very hard for that team to stay connected or to be brilliant when you just don't have just don't have the right people and then the third one is around uh, a supportive context so this is things like um rewards so those rewards can be intrinsic rewards they can be extrinsic rewards um but the team being really clear on you know like how do we celebrate success uh things like learning uh rituals and rhythms that the team all all commit to um and that supportive point about um you know you can have high care and high challenge so those two things can can come together so we can disagree but ultimately we are on each other's side and we want each other to succeed um and this is where you start to get into high performing teams territory right this is like if you look at what a high performing team is if you look at the seven factors that amy edmondson talks about for high trust teams for psychological safety one of those is um i feel like the team are on my side you know they're not going to blame me if something goes wrong um they're not going to talk to another department about me and say that I'm not good at what I do. That kind of high level of trust between you. So you could say support. I think you could equally say trust. And this to me feels more like the how, like how we get stuff done, how we work together, how we show up. Um, and again, it doesn't always mean that like everyone doesn't have to get on all the time uh, because, you know, that's just it, it's inevitable that people with different personalities and different skills will have different points of view. But there's still this kind of overlying mot underlying motivation I guess of going but we want we want to succeed together so it's just interesting to kind of flip the question so yes how can I bring my best to a team but flip the question to also think about how does a team need to look and feel so that we can be our best and then that might also influence some of the actions you take um, or some of your observations about the team you're in now and maybe why you're not as connected as you would like to be, or maybe you have these three things and you think, oh, that's why I'm a seven or an eight. Or maybe two of these feel really great, but there's one where you think, oh, actually, we could do still do with a bit of work there. If you want to dive into this one a little bit more, this was the link on the pod sheet, the HBR article on the pod sheet. So I had a read of that and I was like, oh, it's a really different take to what we talked about. So hopefully that adds a different dimension to the conversation this week. So I've added in a couple of coach self questions this week, thinking again a bit more about you now, the things that you've got high levels of control over. I think useful to start with a, a three words question. What three words do I want people on the team to use to describe me? Now, this is partly about your strengths. So do your strengths show up and stand out? But it is also partly about we talked about with teams I think every time you leave a team, and you will leave lots of teams, um, just because in our squiggly careers we will, you you do leave a kind of legacy with those people. Um, probably more so, I think, than you than you realise. But I think when you go even within the same company into a different team, you're often you stay connected to those people, those people will remember you. Um, and it's sort of like, what do you want those people to remember about you? And they can't remember everything, and they'll be loads of stuff in the middle and lots of things that kind of happen but there'll probably be like a couple of things that stand out about you um, and I think this is where you have a bit of a choice like what do you want people to remember when in five years time they're reflecting on being part of that great team or maybe being part of a really tricky team do you want to be the person who you're like always really supportive I was always a really supportive person uh were you a brilliant listener and are you a brilliant listener were you the person who always made stuff just more efficient, that you managed to get stuff done even when things were hard? Um, and so I think this sort of combines strengths, but also with a little bit of impact, the impact that you're having today um, and the impact that you want to leave behind. And a good build on from that, I think, is a frequency question. So how often are you using your strengths? I think it is hard to bring your best to a team if you are not using your strengths frequently because frequency drives competency for you, but frequency drives visibility. So um, let's imagine I'm great at creative thinking. If only one person in our team sees that, and if I'm only using it 
occasionally or in an ad hoc way, I am not bringing my best to a team. I, that is a good a good uh, gap that I can think about. Okay, so if I want to be known for creative thinking, if that's me bringing my best to a team, where else, how else can I start using that skill in the team? Is that an opportunity to talk to my manager about that? Where else would the team benefit from that skill set? So ask yourself a frequency question. I think it's probably the easiest way to start bringing more of your best to a team. Tr try to use at least one of your strengths a bit more than you are doing today, or at least start talking about them a bit more. Uh, frequency drives competency. So if you use a strength more, you will make it stronger. But frequency also drives visibility. The more you use a strength, the more it will stand out and show up to other people too. So those two things. And then a question for thinking about your team, how well do you know your team strengths? So not just you, but actually thinking about your team. If you were looking around that team and you were thinking, what are the one or two things that I think they are brilliant at? And also just how well do I know those people? How well do I understand what matters to them? This is maybe where you might get into things that feel more values based. So what's most important to them about the work that they do? What's most important to them about um, who they work with and where they work? Um, you know, what matters most to them? What motivates and drives them? Do you have, you might not know all of that and you, not everyone wants to bring all of that to work, but do you know some of that? If you, if you look around your, certainly your immediate team and think, I don't know, I don't know what motivates that person or what drives that person. Um, again, that's a really good thing to go and have a conversation about. Might be a bit intense to kind of start with that, um, especially if you don't know someone very well. But that might just be a really good prompt for thinking, oh, I'm going to arrange like a more informal coffee or a catch up and just ask them a bit about what they do. Like, what does their week look like? That curious career conversation, just get to know people a bit more. And then over time, you often get a sense of strengths and values. Uh, yeah, Sarah, that's a really good observation. As an introvert, you find it hard to interact with a team. Even starting conversations, asking questions can be challenging. Yeah. Also think about um, other ways that you could interact that might feel more comfortable for you. So maybe you prefer writing um, or like, like, for example, I really like leaving voice notes. And I, I honestly think part of that is I, I like the space where I'm not sort of in the pressure of a conversation because I am more introverted. Um, now I don't do it as much to our team as I do to Helen. So I feel for Helen, she gets she gets a lot of voice notes. Sometimes people in our team get voice notes um, because you know, you do need to have conversations too. But I often do find that that's a way to communicate that kind of works for me as somebody who is a little bit more introverted. Um, if you haven't read Quiet by Susan Kane or watched her TED talk, that's a it's a good place to start if you are more introverted. Because I think sometimes we think, or I used to always think, oh, the key to kind of overcoming some of my introversion is to become more extroverted. And it, it never is. It's more, okay, well, how do I, how do I sort of use what I've got um, and sort of do it in my own way? And then once you start to figure that out, certainly um, I found it much easier. But that is, I do appreciate that kind of is hard, especially it probably depends on the safety in your team as well. High safety probably makes it a bit easier. And then the last thing I just wanted to um, suggest in terms of a very specific idea for action is looking for knotty problems. Now, normally we might think, well, that's the last thing I want to do. But I would say in every team and every organization I've ever worked in, there's always some knotty problems around. There's always some things that uh, haven't been solved, that are annoying, frustrating, Sometimes they can be big knots, but sometimes we talked about this in the podcast, they can be small knots. They're just like, it's stuff that needs to get sorted. Probably isn't anybody's job, um, but people will be very grateful if you kind of spend some time on it. And um, this can be everything from um, small things like, I don't know, sorting out how we um, do, spend, do our team days together. Maybe like that always feels a bit unstructured and a bit last minute. I would particularly look for, um, I used to do this more probably at Sainsbury's than I do now, but we'd often have repeated red flags. So, you know, when the same thing happens sort of a few times. So let's say uh, this wouldn't happen now in Amazing If, but it certainly happened more at Sainsbury's. Um, you're doing a team day and people realise about a week before 
and it's always last minute and it's always stressful and you're trying to like cobble together an agenda because nobody's looked forward and nobody's really thought it through and actually those team days are a really important time to spend together um and so for me I go well I can spot that we that's re a reoccurring red flag we don't do a very good job of team days I like that sort of stuff like I like people I like team development I can sort of volunteer to sort that knotty problem I can say to my leader do you want me to look after team days actually I'd, I, I would enjoy that um, I'm good at looking ahead. I'm good at anticipating what's coming up. Um, and I've got the right kind of contacts and connections. And I'm interested enough in the area that I think I'll be able to put together a good agenda. And then suddenly you've kind of brought your best to a team, but you've done it in a way where it's it's sort of a bit of strength solving. You've done something that is sort of relevant and useful um, and it matches the things that you're kind of interested in. And I think we gave the example on the podcast. It's funny, like it's always really stuck with me. Like when we had to um, move floors in Sainsbury's, which sounds really like a really boring thing, but actually it was like really admin heavy. No one really wanted to do it. Um, and it was quite a lot of hassle. I just really remember the guy who just sort of put his hand up and was like, um, oh, I've heard you talk at the leadership team a few times now about like, we need to make a plan for moving floors. I, I can do that if that would be useful. And you know, when you see everyone's shoulders go like, oh yeah, that, that would be useful. And he was really good at it because he was organized and he was on it. And it really, it's funny, isn't it? Like, you know, the things that stick with you. So that's someone who hadn't particularly stood out for me because um, he wasn't someone I worked with loads, but by sort of putting his hands up, hand up to solve a knotty problem. And it's not like you have to do it all the time. He did that one thing, and for whatever reason, probably because I don't like admin, I'm probably very grateful that he sorted it, that sort of really stayed with me. And that was definitely him kind of bringing his best to a team. So just to finish with today, I thought we would do that sort of exercise of going, if you had to just choose one word, if you were now, if I was really kind of uh, doing a bit of a forcing function here, if you were going to choose one word that you would want the team that you're in today to use to describe you, maybe next week to their friend or in a five years time, what one word would you choose? Yes, yeah, Sam, that is a great, that's a, that's a really good one. Christmas team lunch, yeah, because you're already going, oh, you know, it's going to get booked up, you know, everyone's going to get busy. And you're like, dreamy. Somebody's just gone, gone away and sorted it. But uh, let me know in chat, what's your one word? Helpful, authentic, supportive, great. Kind, integrity, energetic, supportive. Optimistic, really nice. I like that little real, yeah. Interested, reliable, human. Patient and persistent, how nice, adaptable. And I think this word is a really good anchor for you to keep coming back to. In the midst of everything that you could do and all the kind of demands on our day, just think about, like, it's always like, it's quite reassuring, I think, often to think, to keep coming back to this. Like, am I being kind? Am I being authentic? Am I bringing energy? Am I bringing my competency? Whatever matters most to you, whatever's most important to you, just remind yourself like, well, this is this is what I want to do. This is kind of how I want to show up and be my best for the team. Imagine doing this exercise as a team. I think that'd be a really, really nice thing to do. So um, if you've got the right kind of team to do this, and I appreciate not every team would do this, but as a team, I think you could say, well, what's the one, what's the one thing that matters to you that you want to bring to the team? And it, you know, if people are saying, Something like competency is quite different to something like, I don't know, patience. But that would actually be really interesting for people to kind of say it out loud. And then also people then will spot more opportunities to be like, oh, well, if that matters to that person or if that's the thing that they sort of want to bring to the team, I can spot an opportunity for that person to bring that thing. Or actually, I could really do with somebody who's a good listener um, or who could act as a bit of a sounding board. I'll go and talk to that person. Just doing the exercise would create connection um I'm writing at the moment uh, as part of the book as well some like small ideas for how we kind of create connection um as a team and how you could do kind of playful things and I think some, something like this is not sort of organized fun it's a very small way of getting to know people I think rather than making these things kind of overwhelming and daunting if we can just sort of break them down and do small things like this like one word 
you go, oh, okay, that's interesting. We sort of, we know a bit more than we did before, but we're not putting too much pressure on ourselves to sort of know everybody's life story or pressure on people to have to share their life story. Uh, so I hope that felt useful this morning. 